Okay, into the energetics topic then. First topic, uh, measuring enthalpy changes. And this is what we're going to look at doing. There's our understandings, and we're going to be doing a few calculations and looking at a few experimental setups as well. So we'll just start by looking at uh, the particles that we'd maybe find in a sample of anything really, a sample of gas, a sample of a liquid, a solid. Some of them will be at very high energy, and some of them will have a relatively low energy. So this is kind of the high energy end. This is the few that have a very low energy. Most are kind of somewhere in between. Now, it turns out that if we were to raise the temperature, right, we make things a bit hotter, temperature is proportional to the kinetic energy of the particles. So in other words, we're giving them more kinetic energy. So if you make it hotter, more of them have more energy. And as you can see here, the curve has shifted to the right. I now have more T2, this is higher temperature, more with higher energy, fewer with lower energy. And you'll maybe notice that this has dropped down. Now, the area underneath this curve represents the total number of particles. And that's not changed. It's a, still the same number as I had at T1. So if I've got more up here, then I've got to have less over here. And as a result, that's kind of dipped down to show that the, the populations are constant. So as we get something a bit hotter, things have more energy, and you can see we get these new curves. Now, when we get onto the kinetics topic, this will become more important. But for a reaction to occur, there's a certain minimum energy that we need, and that is our activation energy. And so you can see that as we increase the temperature, we've now got more particles that have sufficient energy to react. They've got an energy greater than or equal to the activation energy. Uh, we've just defined the terms endothermic and exothermic. So endothermic is a change which is taking in heat energy. So our products are more stable with respect to the reactant. And if you think of something like lighting a Bunsen burner, so you've got methane coming out the tap, and that reacts with the oxygen in the air, then obviously you know Bunsen burners are hot, that's heat energy coming out of there, and we're ending up with our products, carbon dioxide and water. So this case over here, is the mouse gone? There it is. This over here is my exothermic. This one over here is endothermic, so it's taking in heat energy. And uh, you'll see a few examples of this in the experiments that we do. But if you were to measure the temperature of, of a mixture of solutions and the reaction was endothermic, you'd expect to see the temperature of that drop because it's taking in heat energy. So that's what an endothermic profile looks like. And important to this unit, energy is conserved in chemical reactions. So whilst we've lost the energy here, that energy has been gained by the surroundings. And here the energy has been taken in by the surroundings. Um, this is a reaction profile for overall an exothermic reaction. You can see the enthalpy change is going down away. So delta H negative there. Uh, what we've got here are a couple of transition states. So this reaction goes via an intermediate and these energy maxima are called transition states and so the reaction maybe proceeds by a couple of steps through this intermediate and we end up with our overall change being exothermic. Right, we need to be able to make use of this relationship. Q is mc delta t. So the Heat change, Q, is equal to the mass of the substance whose temperature we're measuring. So this is the change in temperature. This is the mass. And it's important to think carefully what that mass is. And this is called the specific heat capacity. And it's the energy needed to raise one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So depending on the units here, you can see it's defined as one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Water has that value. And put it in another way, it's also 4.18 joules per gram per Kelvin. So for every unit temperature change, 
if you've got a gram of it, you've got to do 4.18 joules. And incidentally, that's what a calorie is as well, if you read that on the side of the food packet. So how much energy is needed to raise temperature of 250 centimeters cubed of water by 5 degrees Celsius? Well, mass here, we're dealing with the water. Water's density is 1 gram per centimeter cubed, so that's 250. Heat capacity, 4.18, delta T, 5. Plug the numbers in and you can see what the entropy change is. So every substance will have, I suppose, a heat capacity, something like copper, there you can see it's relatively low so your copper saucepans get hot very quickly but maybe the water inside them takes a little bit longer to boil because of the high heat capacity right so if we're dealing with some solutions solution chemistry very often you'll be using a polystyrene cup to try and maximize some insulation there and you'll have your solutions in there thermometer dipping in you might have a lid on again to try and minimize heat loss and you make an assumption that if you're dealing with solutions, it's not pure water, but you very often assume that you are dealing with water. So you assume that the heat capacity is going to be 4.18, as we saw in the last example. So let's say you mix these together, and there's your temperature change. And this, this is a question to answer. What's the entropy of neutralization for the reaction? Well, we can start by working out what the energy change is. So Q is equal to mc delta t. So the mass total here is 100. One centimeter cubed is one gram. If you're pretending you've got water, they're going to react exactly one to one ratio. So we don't need to worry about which is in excess or anything like that. Then. Um, C 4.18 delta T change in temperature is 4.5 so if you work that out let me find my calculator right so that equals 1881 joules so that's the energy change that we've got exothermic so we can put that as a, as a negative there and now we do need to think about limiting reactants because entropy of neutralization is defined as the energy change for a neutralization reaction per mole of water formed. So I've got to work at how many moles of water are being produced to be able to call it an entropy of neutralization. So if I look at these, which is my limiting reactant? It's one to one. This is going to be my limiting reactant here. How many moles does that correspond to? Well, n equals CV. V is 35 over 1,000. C is 1. So that's going to be 0 0.035 moles. My ratio here is 1 to 1. So I'm going to make 0 0.035 moles of water. So if I want this as joules per mole, then if I divide that by this, I end up with 53,700 and be 42 joules per mole oh dear oh dear nothing's going off so far joules per mole like that which is 53.7 kilojoules per mole that's the enthalpy of neutralization for that reaction. And you know, interestingly enough, these enthalpies of neutralization are often very similar where we've got strong acids and strong bases because the overall change is always that. Right? The chloride ions and the potassium ions, they're just spectator ions. They're still ions in this uh, solution over here. So we expect to see a number around about here for any enthalpy of neutralization. But that's using Q equals MC delta T put my minus in front because it's exothermic it's giving a temperature rise so the the HCl and the potassium hydroxide are reacting in the cup and as they react they emit that energy that energy goes into the water and it's kind of the water that's around it whose temperature that I'm measuring so the temperature goes up exothermic reaction and because it's an entropy of neutralization I've got to work it out per mole of water produced and that's why I went through this extra step to work out how many moles of water are made at the end now, slightly more important.
proved method when you're dealing with these uh, solutions is to start off with the two things separate. You start off with your two things that you're going to mix, keep them separate, and you measure the temperature. It should be fairly constant. On, let's say, the fifth minute, that's when you mix them. Okay, so you put the two things in your container, you give it a stir, and then every minute after that, you take a reading. And what you can do is you can extrapolate back to the point at which that you mix them, and that difference there will give you a more accurate maximum temperature change. Because when you try this in the in the labs, it's maybe going to be difficult for you to see when well when has my thermometer reached its maximum value? What's the biggest number that it gets to? If you use this cooling curve, it's a way of getting a more accurate temperature change value. The other type of enthalpy change that we need to look at is where we're doing a combustion reaction. So we've got a spirit burner here with a calorimeter and dipping into that we've got a thermometer and I've got a stirrer in there as well. I'm trying to minimize this distance here, right? keep, keep this as small as possible. All the time I'm trying to minimize heat loss and it might be that I have a draft shield around it as well uh, to stop some of the heat being transferred away and ideally maybe have a lid on top of that too. So anything I can do to minimize heat, heat loss with systematic errors will improve the data that I get. So here we go, methanol, heating 100 centimeters cube of water, methanol burner decreases in mass, find the enthalpy of combustion of methanol, percentage error if that value is there. Right, so my enthalpy change for using MC delta T, if you think I've, I'm measuring the temperature change in the water, so the energy gain of the water is going to be MC delta T, so that's 100 grams times 4.18 times the change in temperature, which is 9.5. joules and the methanol that's been used so I, I want my enthalpy of combustion to be per mole of substance combusted so I need to find out how many moles of methanol I've used and I've got 0.384 change in mass so uh, number of moles is equal to mass divided by mass of one mole I'm not going to use the correct values from the periodic table we'll just take those that comes out to be when I say I'm not going to use the correct values from the periodic table, I might should have really used ones that are at least close. It's not methane, it's methanol. Methanol is CH3OH. So that's 12, 15, 16, 32. And so that becomes 0 0.384 divided by 0 0.012. And then to get my answer in, joules per mole. I'm going to divide this by the number of moles. So 3971 divided by 0 0.012 equals 0.9. So that's 330917 joules per mole, which is 330 kilojoules per mole. Right. And then that's exothermic, so I can give that a minus sign. To work out my percentage error, I'm looking at difference over that divided by the accepted value. So it's 385 in there. So 54% error. It's pretty sizable, but not unusual given all the heat loss that we're going to be finding here. Now one other source of error which should have been included in this step is we need to consider that the energy gained by the water is also energy gained by this calorimeter. And so if it was a copper calorimeter, then let's say we'd know the weight of that calorimeter. The calorimeter maybe would weigh I don't know, 20 grams. This should have been recorded in the, ex in the experiment. Then we've got the heat capacity of the calorimeter, which is made of copper. And then we assume that the temperature change in that is the same. 
and we would be able to take this value, we'd add it to this one, and that would be the total heat transfer. So we should have included a contribution from this calorimeter as well. Some definitions for you. You can pause me and have a read of that. We also need to know what standard conditions refers to. And again, have a look at that. Be careful, standard conditions, standard states. So when we talk about a substance being in its standard state, it's kind of how you'd expect to find it in the lab. Stable state of a substance at atmospheric pressure. Um, we don't get a temperature stated with it, but very often it is 298 Kelvin. Enthalpy of formation. So this is forming one mole of a substance from its constituent elements in their standard states. So if we want to look at an example of that, let's say we are making, we're looking for the enthalpy of formation of methane. So the substances that go to make up methane are carbon, that's how it's found in standard state, solid, and hydrogen, like that. Let's say we were talking about water. So the e equation that represents the enthalpy of formation of water is going to be coming from hydrogen and oxygen. Now, this is one of the rare examples why I'm allowed to use a half in my equations because my definition is that it's forming one mole. So I'm not going to scale this up. I'm going to keep a half there so that it fits the definition. So that's what we've covered. And everything came from that book.